We're recording this during the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Convention, August 25th, 1995. We're talking with Howard Kennedy, who was a former president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association. He was a native of the Omaha area and is currently general manager of KMTV in Omaha. Howard, let's start out. How did you get started in, uh, in broadcasting? Oh, gosh, a lot of years ago, <laughs> Larry. Uh, I got started in broadcasting, I guess, in high school uh, from a... Uh, high school um, fellow that uh, said, hey, why have you ever thought of uh, being a disc jockey? And there, there was a contest in those days that was running on a, a local radio station. And, uh, and uh, I had done a lot of plays and so forth in high school. And uh, so I said, no, but I, gee, I'd sure like to try it. So I uh, went and auditioned and uh, was selected to be a teenage disc jockey. And there was a big contest and so forth. And uh, I didn't win. I think a guy by the name of Steve Brown was the winner, who is currently on KCAR. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, the, the real life guy that was actually getting paid and had this idea and had these teenage disc jockeys on was a gentleman by the name of Dick Palmquist, who is, uh, uh, as you know, is the executive uh, director now of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association. So that's kind of where I uh, uh, got interested. Um, what was the next step after the contest? How'd you, how'd you pursue it? Well, I, uh, I decided uh, that I, I like to uh, continue in the business somehow, and uh, I was uh, then nearing the end of uh, high school and um, asked this same teacher that had been an influence on me where a guy might want to go to school if he wanted to pursue broadcasting, and at that time there weren't many uh, schools. This was in the uh, late 50s that uh, actually had broadcast facilities and so forth, and <clears throat> One that uh, did was the University of Iowa, and um, that coupled with the fact that I was uh, fortunate enough to play a little baseball uh, at Central High in Omaha and got the uh, eye of Otto Vogel, who was the uh, Iowa baseball coach at that time, um, and he had uh, and lent me a little uh, help uh, in that area. So I, I went into broadcasting uh, then. Uh, as an undergraduate and also played a lot of baseball for the University of Iowa. And of course, the combination thereof, I dreamed of being that, uh, you know, the next Vin Scully or somebody, uh, the next Mel Allen, uh, and doing those things. And obviously my career took a different path, but uh, that was the intent, I guess, when I started out. What, uh, what position did you play in baseball? Oh, I played first base, uh, kinda. kinda no, I, oh, Vogel was a pretty legendary coach. Yes, he was, and former, uh, Chicago Cub, and uh, a guy that was there a lot of years, and uh, and uh, quite a quite an influence on my life because he was a, a, a real no uh, nonsense kind of coach, um, but he let you have fun off the field. Once you were on the field, it was all business, and away from that, uh, you could be a college kid and have a lot of fun. It was also very encouraging of uh, doing other things at the university. In other words, you didn't have to just uh, go to class and play baseball. He encourage you to get into other things and um, so I had the opportunity to uh, uh, do quite a bit with ROTC and uh, thought at one time that I was going to be a career officer, uh, change that, uh, but I, and I also uh, did some theater work and so forth so I wasn't kind of one dimensional in college. When you uh, were at the University of Iowa, the University student, what areas of broadcasting seemed to you to be uh, most attractive to that I uh, was abs uh, while I th while I love radio and will always love radio, um, I found one of the most fascinating parts of our business is really the the jobs behind the camera. And uh, I wanted and later became uh, through Fortune a uh, producer director. I still think that's the best job in television. Um, it's a job that you have the opportunity to know what is expected of you, uh, to actually work with others to make that happen, and then uh, to know whether or not what you have done was done properly. And then, uh, uh, like a lot of jobs uh, I have since had don't allow you, uh, you can then walk away from that and know uh, right then and there that you've done a job and you've done it well, or not so well. That's correct. How did that, uh, how did the classes, uh, the size of productions, the level of productions, the kinds of things that you were able to do as a student? 
It was very hands-on, and you'll recall from uh, uh, your days at Iowa. It was a very hands-on uh, uh, feel. Uh, you did everything, um, much like uh, UNL now, and, and under again under your uh, leadership. And I think that that's very important. You you had an opportunity to uh, uh, to see a, a whole uh, variation of, of, of jobs that are offered in our industry. You graduated from the university. Uh, what, uh, what was the next step in terms of uh, the career path? I had an obligation uh, as an army officer to uh, serve my country, and I did for a couple of years. Um, and uh, then, uh, after getting out of the service. Um, I sent out a zillion resumes and uh, had a couple of uh, had a couple of job offers. One in Manhattan, Kansas, at a radio station. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, also had an opportunity to visit in Lincoln with a gentleman by the name of Dick Chapin, and uh, then had an opportunity to uh, interview in Mason City, Iowa, a property that was owned by Lee Enterprises. Uh, I was offered a job there, and the reason I took that job, quite frankly, is because it had both radio and television. And uh, it was a small enough station that you did everything. And it was tremendously exciting. You, uh, uh, for instance, if you were the farm director, you uh, did your 15 minutes at noon uh, on the farm and then walked down the hall, put on another microphone, and did the same thing on television. So as a, as a young guy out of, uh, out of school uh, and after the service, it was an opportunity that was beyond my wildest dreams. I could be a disc jockey, uh, I could be a uh, television director, I could run a camera, uh, I also did a lot of air work. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there's only about two departments uh, that I haven't worked in in, in broadcasting. I've, I've never been in the business office, and I was never in traffic. But other than that, I've uh, I sold radio, and I've, uh, as I said, worked a camera, and uh, been a director, and uh, worked in master control. And you, you, you had a wonderful, the, the hours were long. Uh, I think I started for 64 bucks a week. Um, Married uh, uh, a young Bambino, and I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade uh, it uh, at all. It was a great way to start in the business. During those years when you were helping you to do lots of different kinds of things, what was your favorite responsibility? Well, I enjoyed being on the air. I, I think uh, I think anybody that's uh, had the opportunity to be on the air and thinks that you can be of some uh, influence on other folks. Uh, uh, enjoys being on the air, uh, um, although I will always remember my mentor and first boss, a guy by the name of Doug Sherwin, told me that uh, don't ever forget, uh, Kennedy, uh, when you're on the air, that somebody can just reach over there and go bing like this and you go like this, bzz, bzz, bing, and you're out of there. Um, I, again, I think probably the, the, the best job I uh, had uh, along the way was, uh, was, a, was a director producer. Um, I think it's a challenge. You work with we work with a lot of people. You have the opportunity to coordinate a lot of things, um, and you're the and you're the person that is. There are no erasers, as I always used to say as a director. There are no erasers. What you punch uh, is what happens. What Mike uh, you ask for is what happens, and and that was always a tremendous challenge to me. And I and I think uh, the opportunity to do other things, whether it's uh, direct a parade or a ball game or something, you know, in addition to public affairs program. Uh, we used to have one wonderful, t of course, in those days, everything was live. So uh, all the commercials, that, there was no rolling tape of commercials that were generally all done in the, in the uh, studio. And, and there were some challenging moments trying to figure out how you're moving cameras around and who gets uh, shot, and who's shooting whom, and who's getting the news guy and, and uh, so forth. Those were exciting days. Then. Uh, I guess I started to move up the, uh, I got an opportunity to be a promotion manager and then a, uh, and then a program director and uh, I was at KGLO uh, AM uh, television for 13 years and through death and attrition I was finally uh, uh, general manager back in 1977. Uh, well let's just make sure that we have for the circle purposes the years that you were in Mason City first were from? 1965 
to 19, I guess, 78 or so. Yeah, 13 years. This is, this is Mason City. Mason City, Iowa. That's and, correct. And then, at, at that pretty fresh the time, the job <coughs> changed within there as you were just described. That's correct, yeah. And so in 1978, you were the general manager of Mason City. Right. And um, about that time in 1975, the uh, FCC had uh, said that there uh, could not be dual ownership in selected markets, and they named seven markets in the country and uh, surprisingly left uh, Detroit and Washington, D.C. and some of those places alone, but uh, did name Mason City, Iowa, because Lee Enterprises owned the television station as well as the newspaper. And they were then asked to divest and you were given X number of years uh, in order to divest. And so in 1977, uh, uh, when I became general manager, uh, we divested of the radio station. Uh, and then in 1978, we knew that we were going to divest of the television station. And at about that time, Lee Enterprises purchased KOIN television in Portland, Oregon. And, uh, I was asked if uh, I wanted to go out to, to Portland, Oregon from the 124th market to the 24th market. Uh, and I said, uh, you bet. And I went out there as, a, as station manager. I was scared to death uh, going from going, jumping 100 markets. But as, uh, as my boss at the time said, ah, there's only, the only difference is there's just more zeros uh, in uh, things in Portland, Oregon. So uh, that was a challenge for us. We were out there eight years. Um, and enjoyed uh, Portland, Oregon uh, very much. Uh, that, was a, uh, that was a time, uh, the early years in Portland, Oregon was when uh, television was really uh, cooking. Um, and then the early 80s, uh, television took a little bit of a sag, as we all will recall, and uh, the, uh, the economics of the industry were down a little bit. I, uh, was then given the opportunity to uh, uh, go to our uh, Lee station in Huntington, Charleston, West Virginia, uh, WSAZ, which is one of the uh, early stations. It went on the air in uh, 49, much as KMTV. And it's, uh, it was the NBC station of uh, the Lee family at that time. And uh, it was the first time that I had been with NBC. I'd always been a CBS uh, affiliate was there two years, uh, enjoyed that very much. And then uh, lo and behold, my boss said to me in August of 1986, uh, we were buying the May properties in Omaha and Tucson. And uh, how would you like to run one of those properties? And I said, you bet, I sure would. And um, he said, if you had your druthers. And I said, if I had my druthers, I'd like to go back to my hometown. And uh, and that worked out that way, and so I've been back uh, eight years. And you, you know, it's one of those things in this in this field, as you know, uh, you don't ever think that you're going to come full circle. Uh, you, you, when you say I'm going to go to work as in, in the television business, and when you get into management, you just kind of go where they tell you to go, and and that's rare that it would be you'd be told to go back to your hometown. Now we're talking about this, uh, your family in, in Omaha. You have a, a fair history of. Uh, yeah, my family came uh, to Omaha um, in the 1800s, uh, and my uh, great-grandfather was the first superintendent of schools in Omaha. And in 1905, I believe it was, uh, excuse me, 1910, um, after he'd passed away, the, uh, the uh, Board of Education and, the, and the, all the powers that be uh, named a school after him, and that... Uh, School it happens to be Howard Kennedy School in uh, in Omaha. Um, his father, then his son, excuse me, was a judge, um, and uh, my father was an attorney. That was one of the real neat appeals when I got to come back here. Uh, my father was still living in 1988, and so I got a a chance to spend uh, uh, a couple of years with him before he passed away. And uh, he was always a great critiquer of. Uh, of everything that went on at the station, and uh, I used to tell him, "Dad, you're the wrong demographic, though." But uh, we uh, that was that was uh, fun. I have a brother and sister that are in the area. My wife is also from Omaha, and she has uh, aunts and uncles around. So, so it's been uh, it's been fun. I do know. I do will tell you this, Larry, that uh, my uh, 
my folks were really uh, uh, amazed, I think probably disappointed, number one, that I didn't go into law uh, and follow my father, but uh, number two, um, before I had gone in the service, briefly after graduating from Iowa, I was with uh, a Northwestern Bell uh, in their management training program. And uh, when I got out of the service, I was offered uh, the opportunity to uh, go back with uh, Northwestern Bell. And um, of course, uh, you know, Northwestern Bell is the, the stable uh, uh, type employer that every mother, uh, I guess, wanted their child to go to work for because you would be uh, uh, assured of uh, lifetime employment, like IBM or something. And uh, instead, I said, no, I'm going to Mason City, Iowa to be a disc jockey. And uh, that, that uh, set them back, I got to tell you that. But you are, in fact, uh, unusual in some ways because, as I understand it, you have spent your broadcasting career with the same company. That's correct. Uh, I feel very privileged. Uh, to uh, have been able to be able to say that. I've been with uh, Lee Enterprises for uh, 30 years, um, and it's a great company. It's a company that uh, uh, challenges people, and if you uh, perform, they give you an opportunity. You always know where you stand. Um, I think they're pretty people-oriented. Uh, they're, they're good communicators. It's, it's, a, it's a broad company, now up to, up to nine television stations. Um, when I started, there were uh, three, Mason City, Iowa, Quincy, Illinois, and Mankato, Minnesota. And now we're in places like uh, Portland, Oregon, and, uh, and uh, Tucson, Arizona, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Honolulu, Hawaii, as well as Omaha, Nebraska. Or typically, the Federal uh, Communications Commission, the federal government, has looked upon favorably a local ownership, uh, people who are interested in the community operating the station. Uh, although the Enterprises is an Iowa-based company, you are somebody who is their agent here, their manager here, but you are a native of, of the city. What's the, what's the difference between the native who understands the town operating the television station and somebody who does not have that perspective? Well, I think um, yeah, I was gone for 25 years, so it takes some startup again. You know, you, it, it isn't the same as, as when you left, obviously. Uh, but I think you, have a sen you need, as a broadcaster, to get a sense of the community no matter where you are. I think that's one of the things that uh, can be said of broadcasters. They are community-oriented people. They need to know the pulse of the community. You need to be out. You need to have a, a conscience, as it were, as to uh, what's going on. Um, one of the things with Lee Enterprises, Larry, is they, they're, it's a very autonomous company. Uh, you have some, some challenges and some goals, obviously that relate to, to finance, uh, relate to ratings, and some of those other measurable items. But um, how you get there and uh, how you do it is pretty much on your own. Uh, you get support, and that's the way our corporation has always kind of acted. We'll give you the support, but uh, you, you're in the community, you know the community. Uh, we expect you to, uh, to operate inside that community. And whether it's radio or, or television, I think uh, that's the way most broadcasters operate. I think that there is a commitment to community. There's a commitment to service, uh, or I don't think you'd be in this business. Um, and, and that means that you need to know a little bit about the community and uh, what makes it tick, uh, not only at the city hall level, but uh, out in the streets as well. Talking about broadcasting in Omaha, um, Omaha has fostered a lot of uh, uh, outstanding people, um, so I guess you can say that uh, historically Omaha has uh, has uh, been a great place to be a to be a broadcaster. Um, the you know uh, Tom Brokaw and uh, Floyd Calber and uh, John Coleman, uh, to name to name a few. Johnny Carson, obviously, there, there's been a lot of people uh, through here. One of the things I think when I think about Omaha uh, television particularly is the quality of news product, the quality product that all of the stations put on the air, all three major uh, network stations. Uh, there's a competitive factor, certainly. But I think when you travel around this country and you take a look at uh, what you see in regarding reporting talent, regarding anchor talent, regarding looks, um, the ability, the graphic look, uh, the, the ability of, of photographers 
on the Omaha level, I'd, I'd put us up against any market in the country, and I mean that I'd include the top one and two. Uh, there is a there is a uh, a real dedication, uh, and maybe it's fostered by competition, to be a quality uh, news uh, service, and I think that the the news product in this marketplace speaks to that. Talk about the relationship between the audience and the television program structure, the, the decision makers, as you perceive it. Uh, audience feedback is um, is constant in Omaha, uh, whether it's on the telephone um, or uh, in, in in person. Uh, we certainly do uh, periodic breakfasts with uh, with leaders, uh, but I think uh, I think the the people in this community let you know what they like, what they dislike. Um, they're pretty darn vocal when they see something that they don't like. Uh, whether it's an interruption of a program or if it's uh, something that they don't think uh, someone was treated fairly or uh, uh, or conversely if they think you've done a good job uh, they'll step right up and place that telephone call talk to you in person and i'm not just saying me uh, they know people that work at the station and whether you're uh, in sales uh, in the tech area <clears throat> in the production area or an on-air talent I think uh, people know that you're in the television business. They don't, in this community, they don't hesitate to express their opinion as to, to the job you're doing or the job we're doing. Well, you remember growing up in Omaha and television came on the air in 1949. What kind of impact did you recall that you and your friends and your family part of These are taking me back now. But uh, I do remember that um, in our neighborhood, the uh, Ed Creighton family was the first family to get uh, television. Um, that's the, uh, I guess, it'd be about the great, great uh, grandson of John Creighton, founder of Creighton University. Uh, Ed had three daughters, Jeannie, uh, Marianne, and Kathy. And uh, we had a whole bunch of kids in that neighborhood that played kick the can all through the summer months. And uh, one day I can remember uh, Ed Creighton coming home uh, with a furniture truck or something uh, playing up and this thing that they brought into their living room, uh, this television set, uh, changed, kicked the can forever, you know? I mean, we, it certainly diminished the time that, that, uh, that we did that, for a while anyway. Uh, everybody was enraptured by that, uh, by that television set in the Creighton uh, living room and we spent a lot of time in front of it. As a young guy, I guess, <clears throat> Interests me uh, immensely. Uh, I was fascinated by it. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't get over it. The other thing I thought was interesting, and I don't know as I thought about it at that time, e except to say that every parent in our neighborhood knew about what time they could expect uh, uh, to make a call for dinner and where everybody could be called. Um, and so, you know, consciously at the time, I'm sure I didn't think about it. But as I think about it now, it was a it was kind of a bonding thing that went on that television set. Uh, some kids that weren't particularly good at uh, softball or kick the can or something were still all sitting in that in that living room with us. Uh, and it and as I said, you know, you 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 were all there, you were all together. Uh, um, so I guess I guess it had an influence that way as well. Not only on not only watching the talent and watching the and being fascinated by the programs, but uh, having the ability to uh, discuss and, and, and bond with, uh, with all those other kids that were in that room. And this was the days of black and white television. Yes, sir. The KMTV was one of the earliest stations to come on with uh, color television, as I understand it, in about 55 or 56. That's correct. Do you recall any similar kinds of experiences or changes when color television came along and became uh, something that you would pay attention to? I, I, you know, I recall the fascination um, again, it's, it's kind of like perhaps where, where we are today uh, with HDTV, <clears throat> that being, I'm not sure that that was uh, consumer driven. It was uh, technologically driven by the RCA folks. Um, and uh, they were the ones that really pushed it. And obviously it took some leadership then by selective television stations across the nation to say, yes, that's the direction we're going to go. KMTV was one of those stations that stepped up to the plate and said, we're going to expend these dollars. 
And because of that, um, uh, the consumer then, after seeing it and being become fascinated with it, said, wow, gee, i got to have one of those things. And that's kind of like where we are today, because I'm still uh, of the mindset that uh, HDTV is not being consumer-driven. Uh, rather, it's being, uh, it's being technologically or uh, bureaucratically uh, driven. But it will come. It will happen. Uh, stations will, of necessity, get into HDTV. And uh, probably a similar thing will happen that happened with color, Larry. Since you've been back in the state of Nebraska, you've uh, moved into several community leadership positions, and you've also been a leader of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association as a board member and through several offices and president of the association. What's the role of a professional association like the Nebraska Broadcasters Association in, in the uh, leadership and the change of broadcasting? Um, certainly, I think it's. Uh, I think one of the biggest things any association plays is the ability to get uh, others to network. Uh, you get people together. You get them thinking about their product. You get sharing information. Um, you can get marvelous ideas as a television broadcaster listening to a radio guy uh, and vice versa. I think, the, um, I think what the association does is um, serve as a, uh, a collective voice for the state and gives the opportunity for us as a state to be heard on a national level uh, collectively. I think that was certainly the case when we uh, uh, were all behind the cable bill uh, of a couple of years ago. Uh, this association stepped up and, uh, and made something happen. One of the things that I recall very vividly when I was on the board, uh, I guess I was immediate past president, was our state's association's ability to, in fact, in a short legislative session get a bill passed, LB 901 specifically, that tax exempted television stations. Uh, something that was really unheard of. But um, because we had the support of the radio broadcasters, although it, did not, it was not something that directly affected radio, uh, might indirectly, but I won't get into that, um, and because we were able to, we had an association with the governor, uh, a positive association, we're a, we were able to get uh, major legislation moved through the Nebraska legislature uh, to the um, boon of all uh, broadcasting in this state. Uh, so that's something that I, I remember fondly from, from when I was on the board. I think that's also something that the association has done. The other thing I remember fondly when I was on the board <clears throat> when I was president, as a matter of fact, was making uh, Governor Ben Nelson uh, a friend of Nebraska broadcasters. Um, I also think back to the time of, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to have Charles Corralt come and speak uh, uh, to the Nebraska Broadcasters Association uh, in August. And, and quite frankly, that was one of the last uh, public things that he did. He retired a couple of years uh, thereafter. Um, and that was, that was a thrill. I was glad to be able, involved in that. I, th I think, um, Something else an association does is it works together collectively to uh, bring a lot of uh, issues um, to the public's mind. And uh, I guess the greatest thing that I think we have done is uh, work so very hard on the uh, drug abuse situation in the state. Um, and we've done it uh, over a number of years through uh, the number of campaigns and uh, we've done it with other entities. A Mutual of Omaha was, um, was involved with us for a number of years. Uh, but we have, I think, raised an awareness across this state um, about uh, the, the necessity of, of being conscious of, of drug and drug abuse. And, and uh, that's something else I think that the association has done and done very well. The social responsibility on behalf of the broadcaster, which is in addition to the entrepreneurial or economic effort, but talk a little bit more about the role of the association, the role of the broadcaster in terms of that ability to make some changes in society. Well, um, as I said earlier, I think uh, most people that, uh, that reach the management uh, level in this, in this business uh, have to have a, uh, have to be aware that there's a, a social need in some areas. And um, you uh, then have the opportunity, it seems to me, to bring those to the public's attention. And then once that happens, um, if you can be that catalyst, then I think the public 
begins to do what they do, and that is uh, answer those questions, address those issues, um, secure the right conclusions. Uh, sometimes we can do that directly, but I think more often than not, we are the catalyst uh, versus the end all be all on that thing. Um, and I see that as an individual doing that, an individual station, as it were, uh, as well as an association. Lord, since legislation is so important because broadcasting is a regulated industry, um, please go back with me a little bit and explain the issue with the 901 bill, what the regulation was, why it was a problem, and how, how it needed to be uh, changed. Oh, Larry, I can't recall. The issue, you've stumped me because I, I'm, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to, uh, remember this now. The issue was uh, syndicated programming. Um, and the legislature wanted to tax um, us on syndicated programming uh, differently than they taxed property. They wanted to tax, in effect, the license uh, of the syndicated product versus that tape, which is the property of, that, of, the, uh, of the product. Um, and further, they wanted to make that a retroactive tax so that uh, for whatever you had in syndicated product, you would owe a percentage of that to the state. Um, quite frankly, it, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars to every station involved, and, and if you're an independent, it would be uh, even more significant than as an affiliate. Because of the ability to purchase syndicated programming as opposed to the network affiliation agreements. Yes, sir. Um, what the what this, the state had done for years is tax the physical property of the tape, which is which is what it seemed to us made sense. Um, so what 901 in effect did was uh, exempt the syndicated license uh, property of broadcasters. And, uh, and we were successful in doing that and, uh, and we'll be ever uh, eternally grateful <laughs> for that association and their lobbying efforts. And to Governor Nelson who was uh, really our champion. How are you, uh, of course, have a background in a family in terms of being interested in uh, legal issues and uh, public issues and broadcasting. It sounds as if you enjoyed the opportunity to deal with some of the legislative kinds of features that are part of this. Is that, is that fair to say in terms of President Association? Yeah, that's, that's very fair to say. I, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed uh, lobbying. We did a lot of lobbying. Uh, uh, I happen to be on the CBS Affiliates uh, Advisory Board as well, and we did a lot of lobbying in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, over the cable bill, and, and we certainly did a lot of lobbying uh, locally, and <clears throat> and um, and we did a lot of lobbying on the local level with the cable bill, with just the city council, for instance, to get them to understand. Part of the, uh, I think, part of the fun of talking to the legislators is to get somebody to understand our business. Um, you know, people think because I've often thought this, Larry, because I buy that television set. I own that television set, and I have the ability to control that television set. I can choose whichever channel, whichever program, whichever personality I want to. I, therefore, know an awful lot about that industry. Uh, and in truth, they really don't. You know, our industry is, uh, while I'm not saying it's the most complex thing in the world, there are a lot of things, a lot of innuendos, a lot of hidden mechanisms, a lot of different roads that, uh, that don't readily come to mind. The whole syndication issue of how uh, my mother could never understand why she lived in Omaha and saw uh, uh, Mike Douglas, for instance, on WOWT uh, Channel 6 in Omaha at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. She would visit me in Mason City, Iowa, and we had excuse me, our competition had Mike Douglas on. Not only were they not a, the same network, but it was on at a different time. 
And there's those kinds of things. People never understand that. Another thing people always have a tough time understanding is what the relationship is an affiliate has with a network. You know, we are licensed by the FCC to serve the convenience, need, and necessity uh, of your community. That gives us the license. We have the FCC license. CBS doesn't have the FCC license for Omaha, Nebraska. KMTV, the Enterprises does. So we have the ability, as we find a responsibility to preempt programming uh, when we think it's uh, germane, when we think it's important and in the public's interest. We can do that. Um, the general public has a tough time with that concept. They don't, they don't understand uh, a lot of that. So there, so there are some differences in our, in our business that are kind of difficult to explain to people. I've been trying to explain them for 30 years, unsuccessfully most of the time. During your position of leadership of the State Broadcasters Association, <coughs> State issue with 901, but you were, I think, president elect at the time that the 1982 cable bill was coming into operation and became president actually about the time that uh, some of the congressional elections were taking place. Talk a little bit about the 1992 cable bill as it applies to Nebraska broadcasting and, and the kinds of variables that you, are, you might bring forth. Um, we saw, quite frankly, the um, a, a need for the cable bills um, because. Um, free over-the-air broadcast um, was being uh, continually placed in a position of uh, lesser <coughs> import is probably the wrong word, but uh, uh, lesser impact uh, than cable because cable continued to grow and grow and grow. And we'll recall that, uh, you know, as recently as 1985, cable wasn't much of a much of a competitor. So the, broad, so the uh, FCC and Congress and their wisdom uh, unloosed cable. Uh, they, they could do just about anything they wanted to, and by golly, they did. Um, and consequently, things escalated. And um, before you knew it, you had cable guys competing against free over-the-air broadcast um, from a much more uh, powerful uh, economic position. Uh, cable has always had two um, revenue sources. Uh, not only the revenue source that they have from commercials, but obviously the revenue source of the subscribing of, uh, that we have to pay to cable. So um, free over the air broadcast was um, uh, being disadvantaged. Um, and quite frankly, I think more so in the Scotts Bluffs and the Hastings of this world than, uh, than perhaps in larger communities. Um, Scotts Bluff, for a specific example, uh, was in trouble with uh, Denver because people wanted in Scotts Bluff wanted to watch the Denver uh, stations versus the Scotts Bluff station. And because there was no regulation that said the, the, they couldn't, uh, the poor Scotts Bluff broadcaster was really at a terrible economic disadvantage because they were bringing in the Denver signals um, and, and, the, and people were watching them as opposed to their local broadcaster for a variety of reasons and, and I, you know, don't, um, that's uh, individual's uh, uh, preference. But the fact of the matter is uh, the free over-the-air broadcaster in Scotts Bluff, uh, Nebraska was disadvantaged. Um, disadvantaged to the, to the point of uh, economic retardation. Um, part of the thing that the Cable Act uh, of, 80, of 92 did was um, make it more restrictive for those uh, signals from elsewhere. Uh, so this gave some hope, uh, as it were. It gave uh, a, a better identity uh, on a local basis to the, to the Scotts Bluff guy. And he, and he got back on his cable system and, and had some clout on his cable system. It did a variety of other things. It, it, it more regulated cable. Uh, now that's since gone the other way uh, with the new Telecommunications Act um, uh, that has uh, passed both uh, houses uh, of our Congress and now we'll be back into committee and we'll see where that goes. But um, the Cable Act of 92 was important to I believe, so think, uh, let me just summarize by saying that I think it was important because it gave free over-the-air broadcasters 
um, recognition for their signal. Uh, you, now cable people had to go to you and say, we'd like to carry your signal. And we would do, would you like us to carry your signal? And if our answer was yes, uh, then that set into gear some negotiations. Um, and that's what it was all about. I, I, don't, I don't fault cable. Cable, cable is, is a wonderful uh, uh, thing for free over the air broadcasting. It extends our delivery. And in certain areas, it cleans up our delivery. But the fact is, uh, cable uh, never paid one dime to any broadcaster. All they did was pirate the signal and put it into your house. Uh, it's something that free over the air broadcasters never felt good about. The Cable Act of 92 gave us a value for our signal, and I think that that's uh, significant. You've had some national opportunities as a member of the CBS affiliates, <coughs> for example, to deal with things, and you also, in that capacity, and as leader of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association, dealt with members of the House of Representatives from Nebraska, the United States Senators from Nebraska, and, and a variety of, of kinds of things and kinds of issues. Talk a little bit about the relationship of the ability to govern the ability of the informed electorate to get ideas, to hear what the congressman or the congresswoman or the senator is doing, and the relationship of local broadcasting as a part of the democratic government. Well, um, local broadcasting uh, means an awful lot to our elected officials. Um, it is through us that they are able to reach their constituents on a regular and meaningful basis. And I think uh, particularly television, because you can now see uh, that individual as well as hear their voice. You can now see facial expressions, understand tones of voice matching up with the facial expressions and so forth. Um, we have, uh, of necessity, I think, need to keep our elected officials uh, up to speed on concerns of broadcasters. Well, we have been very fortunate, um, I believe, uh, in the recent past at least, to have a wonderful relationship with, for instance, Senator Jim Exon. Uh, he's been, not only has been uh, officially uh, said a friend of Nebraska broadcasters and has received that uh, uh, honor, but he has in truth been a longtime friend of Nebraska broadcasters. And, and with Jim Exon, Larry, if you explain the issue, um, he, he understands the issue. And he is a firm believer in free over-the-air broadcast, and always has been. Um, we have another friend in, in Governor Nelson, I think a, a like uh, a proponent of ours. Uh, but, but the whole democratic process of our elected officials being able to address or answer uh, constituents via uh, the broadcasting medium is uh, is very very important to the pro to the process uh, of this country. Compare the mission in the current society of a television station and the, the newspaper. Um, I, I'm not sure that they are dissimilar. Um, the um, Obviously, the newspaper has, a, has an advantage over broadcasters in the, in the view of the fact that they can do things in the pages. Um, they can do in-depth things. Um, but like it or not, Mr. Newspaper Man, uh, more people get their news from television than any other source. And I sometimes say that uh, with a touch of sadness. I don't think an informed public can rely on one uh, medium for their news. I think if you're a well-rounded individual, and that's the way we, I hope we're teaching our children today, that they not only need to watch uh, their, their television news at night, but they need to uh, be daily newspaper readers, and they also need to be uh, periodical readers. Uh, the Newsweeks and the Times and the U.S. News and World Reports, that's the, that's the uh, society that I hope for. And that's, uh, but, but, but like it or not, uh, television is, is what is where it is. And um, so I think our mission, as it were, as, as broadcasters, is to, prevent, is to present things uh, openly, honestly, um, 
with a, a right balance. Um, I think the other thing that, that, that makes our medium uh, exciting versus newspapers is that, and sometimes to our detriment, granted, um, is that you can actually see, feel, hear, almost touch uh, what's happening out there. Um, we all know historically what, uh, what an impact television had uh, regarding the Vietnam War. Uh, I hope that television can have an equal impact on uh, some, of the, some of the violence that uh, we see running in our cities now. Uh, perhaps if people continue to see this up close and personal, um, we'll go even further in the direction we need to go, and that is uh, correcting these, uh, these violent issues that we have in our society today, tragically enough. But television uh, tells that story, and we tell the story very, very well, because we tell the story with pictures uh, as well as with words. Talk about about 10, 10 12 minutes left. All right. Well, that's good. Let's go. We're about done. Talk about, in, in perhaps a, another kind of situation, about the educational value of television in the informal sense. What people see on the screen, what they perceive, how that helps them uh, with their life, with, uh, with democracy, with other kinds of things. I hope, uh, I, I always, uh, remember a, uh, the, the wife of the, of the first general manager I worked for, a woman by the name of Patty Lors, uh, used to, I used to love to listen to her at, uh, at affairs when someone would come up to her and after learning what her husband did, uh, would say, oh, I never watch television. And, uh, and uh, Patty used to say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you, you don't. You, you don't watch 60 Minutes? Oh, 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 well, I, I watched 60 Minutes. Oh, you didn't, you didn't see on the news the other night? Well, oh, oh, well, I, I, I watch news. Oh, you didn't get to see that funny All in the Family story? That we, oh, well, I, I watch All in the Family also. Um, anyway, there's, uh, there's still a lot of that, you know. Uh, um, but we have an obligation, and, uh, and, I, and I think uh, television is very educational in all of its programming. Be that uh, cartoons, uh, news, uh, drama, sporting events, uh, specials, what have you. Um, people spend a lot of time in front of their television set. Um, I think in the main you can learn um, how to use the language. Uh, I think in the main you can learn about other societies, about people being different from one another. Um, I think you can certainly learn about other parts of this world, of this country, of our community. Um, I think television can be very educational, uh, just as theater can be very educational, just as movies can be very educational. I'm very afraid of the V-chip, um, which uh, Representative Markley uh, brought up in the telecommunications bill. Uh, I don't think you can, leg I hope we can't legislate our morals. Uh, it's up to parents, I think, to be the controllers of that dial. Um, and I've heard over the years, as, as I know you have, Larry, um, every excuse in the world of why uh, television is too violent and there's too much sex and, 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 and so forth and so on, and, and by golly, we really, need to, we really need to do something about it. I just ask, rhetorically, I guess, how many parents uh, let their kids uh, run with whomever they want to run with? How many parents don't uh, check out what movies the kids are going to? How many parents don't take control of other aspects of their children's lives? They do. If they're good parents, they do. And they shouldn't draw the line with, oh, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do the same parenting regarding television. Uh, I, th I, think it's, I think it's ludicrous. You need to parent television. I don't think that every program that's on the air is fit for, for uh, young consumption. Uh, conversely, I don't think a lot of the things that people uh, find uh, uh, distasteful are, at least in my opinion. Now, one of the great things about, uh, about this country and about that television set we have is that uh, we have a choice. We have not only, and now, heaven's sakes, we're go 
what are we up to now? 500 choices if you listen to, uh, if you listen to the cable gurus. But we do have a choice. Um, and the choice is not only different channels, different programs, but also the whole choice of whether or not I watch. And that's that little on and off switch that's on every television set. It's on every radio. If I'm offended by this shock jock or that television program, I can control that. And I hate like the Dickens to see the government think that they can control that. Howard, in the time remaining, we're going to take you in a slightly different direction and ask you to think of the names of people in the broadcasting business in Nebraska and elsewhere who you think are folks uh, on the national level, too. Folks that you have associated with uh, that, um, that exemplify some of those kinds of ideal broadcaster characteristics that you talk about. Um, on a national level, uh, I think... It, it could be in Oregon, it could be in Mason City, it could be in Nebraska. Well, I think a guy by the name of Doug Sherwin was a great influence on me, and uh, program director, the guy that had the foresight and the genius, I might add, to hire me <laughs> back in 1965. Um, and he was a mentor of mine, and, uh, he, but he was a, he, he was, first he was a family man, uh, had a wonderful family, has a wonderful family. Uh, secondly, he was an ethical man. He was a religious man without wearing his religion on his sleeve. He was just a quality guy, uh, a lot like a lot of people that I've uh, worked with in Lee, Lee Enterprises. Uh, so certainly uh, he comes to mind. Um, several people that, uh, on the national level, I guess, uh, I think a quality guy is Howard Stringer that uh, used to be with uh, CBS. Um, I think of uh, some, some influences on my life in, in, in college, I guess. Sam Becker comes to mind, a guy that you uh, certainly are familiar with. I think individuals such as yourself, Larry, that uh, are in this business, uh, preparing people to go into this business, uh, make a contribution. Um, I can't, uh, I guess, I can't think of any other people right offhand that, uh, that come to mind. I mean, I, I'm a, to be very honest with you, I'm afraid to get going on this because I'm afraid I'm going to miss somebody or think, gee whiz, why, I wonder why he didn't say that about so-and-so. Uh, but there have been a lot of people that have influenced, uh, have influenced me, and uh, I, I just would say, in in in, uh, in conclusion, that there have been some up days and down. I mean, as there is in every business, and this, and this business that we're in now is taking a, an exciting, although uh, a, a rather scary turn. We're, we're the technological things are heating up, and we're getting uh, busier than ever, uh, and we're in a, in another change mode. Um, but all that considered, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't change a darn thing in my life uh, uh, w regarding this business. It's been a, it's a fun ride. No day is like the, the one previous, and I know that tomorrow will be different from today. I don't think everybody can say that on their job. So I've been blessed uh, to be in this business. I believe in this industry. Uh, uh, I think it's here for a long, long, long time, and uh, I think we do a lot of good. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to have been a part of that. Thank you, Larry.